Um, so thank you all for um, a wonderful uh, series of introductions leading up into this moment. Um, thank you all for giving a good foundation in um, the importance of government information. We are going to talk a little bit about that here um, and a little bit of the history. So. Um, um, yeah, I won't be adding too much more to what's already been stated. Um, again, thank you for having me here. I'm very honored to be invited to um, be part of this really wonderful um, event. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to present to you the long view of librarianship and government information. And as Rosemary mentioned, I am a research associate with the Long Now Foundation, and that's actually how she found me, um, uh, looking at this long, uh, long-term thinking um, and trying to then apply that to libraries, archives, and government information. Um, okay, my, yeah, this is working. And so again, here we are here, uh, um, with the support of the Rachel Wingfield D'Angelo Endowed, Endowed Lecture Series and for the 70, 75th anniversary um, of University of Mary Washington being a federal uh, depository library. Um, 75 years is a lifetime, literally a lifetime. The, in 2011, the US expectancy, life expectancy rate was 79 years. So there is a lifetime worth of government information here, um, if not more, um, at the library. So, long view. What do I mean by long view? Um, so again, pulling from my association with the Long Now Foundation, I'm going to quote from Stuart Brand, one of the founding members of the Long Now Foundation. Um, he says that civilization is revving itself into a pathologically short attention span. <laughs> the trend might be coming from the acceleration of technology, the short horizon perspective of market-driven economics, the next election um, perspective of democracies, or the distractions of personal multitasking. All are on the increase. Some sort of balancing corrective, balancing corrective to the short-sightedness is needed. Some mechanism or myth which encourages the long view and the taking of long-term responsibility, where long-term long is measured at least in centuries. So they created this really nice infographic of how we can, how we think of now now, right? So today, we think of now as three days. So yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Um, and honestly, I think three days is a bit long for the way we think of, of now. Uh, if, if we think of Andy Warhol and the 15 minutes of fame, maybe now is more like 15 minutes and not three days. Um, and so they also say nowadays, well, like nowadays, we think of we have this decade, we have a decade ago, and a decade in the future. Hey, well, here, I hear myself now. Is that better? Okay, I have to figure out where, to, where the sweet spot is. <laughs> um, but their conceiving of the long now is not a day, not 10 years, but 10,000 years, right? So 10,000 years in the past, and we need to start thinking about how our actions today can be reflected and communicated with the future 10,000 years in 10,000 years. Um, and I, when I started library school, I discovered, I learned about digital preservation and I uncovered some, I, I've discovered the Long Now Foundation. I immediately became a member um, because it was absolutely fascinating in thinking how do we preserve our information and especially preserve our digital information 10,000 years, right? 10,000 years. Like, what happened 10,000 years ago? Um, well, let's see what happened 10,000 years ago. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take us on a journey along this path here from our distant past um, and move us into the present tense. And as I am doing this, I want you all to start thinking, how do we move the story of who we are as a people into the future by 10,000 years. And I'll share with you some of my ideas and some, um, some of my thinking around this, and then I, I want to hear from you and see what you think. Um, so here we go. This is the beginning of our journey. Um, this is going to be, it's a very long story I'm going to be telling and a very broad story. So it's going to be kind of quick and dirty, abbreviated. 
um, we're going to talk about re how, how human information, how our story has been recorded over time, how, it, how government information, where it came from, how it's been recorded over time and shared, and then libraries, and then information technologies from 15,000 BC to however far in the future we can actually imagine. Okay, 15,000 BC, we have the Lascaux Caves. This is um, considered to be one of the earliest forms of recorded like human documentation of what they're seeing and doing. This is a long time ago, 15,000 years. This record is still, still here for us to see. So these are human beings who have gone out and seen animals and drawn them on caves, so with paint on stone. Um, and really miraculous that this is still accessible to us today. 3500 BC, so that was, a, that was a big jump, just in case you didn't notice. Um, <laughs> a lot of time passes, and this is essentially where civilization as we know it starts. And what is civilization? What do, what do we need for civilization? We need a way to record our ideas and we need governing bodies. And these are two of the most important pieces of, of what makes a civilization. And so um, apropos of today to government information through time. So this is um, cuneiform. So uh, pressed into uh, ceramics or pressed into clay and then fired to harden. Um, and this has lasted um, thousands of years. And I don't know if you've noticed yet, why is Dr. Ryan putting a zero in front of all of these dates, right? We normally just see 3100 BC or 1999. But um, if we are thinking in tens of thousands of years, we need to add an extra space in front of our dates. Um, and I think this idea came about through the Long Now Foundation around who remembers the millennium bug from 2000? <laughs> and like, oh, we have to change all of our computer systems to, to uh, enable us to record more than just two spaces and our dates. And so Base, looking at that and also extending our notion of now into tens of thousands of years, we're adding a zero to our date here. All right, so we have written language. And then here, 1790 um, BCE, we have the Code of Hammurabi. So this is a record of law um, from thousands of years ago, carved into stone, right? And still accessible today, right? Not tens of thousands of years, but still quite a long time. Um, and more stone carvings. This is a kuduru, which is um, a boundary, a stone marker that um, records more uh, like it's gov governing information about who owns the lands and where the boundaries of those lands are. Carved into stone, still accessible today. And then 1250. We have the library at Thebes. This is not actually the library, but just a, an illustration of Thebes. It was considered to be one of the first collect large collections of uh, recorded information. Um, no longer available to us today. Um, I no, uh, I'm, try I'm trying to remember how many how many items they think that were were at the Library of Thebes, but I don't I don't remember. Um, I do remember, however, at the Library of Alexandria and all the librarians in the room, we can, <sighs> we, know, we know what happened here. <laughs> it's a sad story. Um, but it was estimated they had about half a million scrolls. Um, they don't know for certain, but through various acts of destruction and, and war and dominance, they were destroyed and, and yeah. We're all, we're all heartbroken, um, but still continuing. So 325, this is, again, before the Common Era. So this is still a very long time ago. Um, and scrolls recorded on um, papyrus, on vellum, so animal skins and whatnot. And then, so this, this excites me. Who's heard of, who, who has heard of this before? A couple of you. This is a computer. Um, 100 BCE. This is a, me a mechanism, a machine that can compute um, astro astronomical locations, so locations of planets and stars. 
a computer. We think that computers are a really new invention and a really new thing in our lives. This is an analog computer. Really, it's the digital computers that's changed the world of, of information as we know it today. Um, so I want to point this out before I move to the next slide. 100 BCE, 200 years before paper. So <laughs> um, not quite as new as we thought they were. Um, so um, paper invented by Siloon in China um, using uh, mashed mulberry or mulberry pulp. Um, what we usually call rice paper is actually made out of mulberry. Um, so 100, so now we're in the common era. We've got two extra spaces in front of the year. Um, so paper and the invention of paper made it much more easy to um, it's much cheaper and easier to produce than vellum and animal skins, and so we are able to record more information and distribute it e more easily. However, this is all hand drawing, right? Um, this is long before um, printing presses, which we'll get to. Um, and then moving back to recording laws over time, we have uh, the Corpus Julius Civilis, the body of civil law, so Emperor Justinian than recording laws to be shared throughout, um, throughout his domain. Right. This is five, 529 to 534. And uh, similarly moving forward in the UK, they recorded all land holdings and animal livestock holdings in the Domesday Book. Um, and I bring this one up especially um, because the Domesday Book became a story of um, sort of not so much a loss of information, but of the, the dangers of recording valuable information in various digital media. Um, in the 80s, I believe, they tried to bring back the concept of the Domesday Book, and they went around the country and they recorded stories and videos, and they saved them on laser discs who's got a laser disc player yeah you've got one okay <laughs> um i use we had laser disc players when when i was young and it was really this amazing technology and the disc were like 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 records the size of records not like our smaller discs now um but so one person in this room has a laser disc player um and i think that's actually kind of a mirac miraculous thing <laughs> um but so accessing the content in this laser disc is now almost impossible just by, by numbers. Um, and so they had to spend a lot of time and a lot of money retrieving that information off of those old laser discs to make it accessible today. And I think only in a, the project was shut down in 2008 and it was only recently re revived in 2011. I think the content is finally available online. Um, okay, so let's move forward. Ah, as I mentioned, we have the printing press. So Gutenberg um, um, came up with the idea of the movable type, which you brought up. Um, in uh, what was the document that you said that was in, in movable type? The what? Oh, the War of the Rebellion document. So uh, movable type allowed us to... Um, so remember before this, most... Uh, documents recorded on paper were painstakingly copied, usually by monks. Um, so it makes it really difficult to make lots of copies of one particular message and distribute it widely throughout, throughout the population. And so the printing press made it easy to you set your movable type and you press, you put some ink on there, you press a piece of paper, and your big long page of text is automatically printed exactly the way you intended it to be. Um, so this allowed us again to share more information more widely and with a larger amount of the public. Um, not everybody at this point, but still much more than ever was before. Okay, so 1602, looking at libraries, we have the Bodleian Library in Oxford, um, started with about 2,000 books. Beautiful, we love libraries. Um, and so this is leading up to, so this is in the UK, and leading up to our break in the United States from the British, right? So, and we have 
the Library of Congress, just up the street, founded in 1800. But just a little bit before then, so this is my brief history of uh, the Federal Depository Program. There's a lot missing from here. Thank you for filling a lot of those gaps in. Um, but so I'm going to start with a quote from James Wilson, who was one of the um, signatories on the Declaration of Independence, 1776. Um, but during the was 1787 debates in the Federal Convention, he very importantly stated the following. The people have a right to know what their agents are doing or have done, and it should not be in the option of the legislature to conceal their proceedings. And so this was the, this founding idea that we, um, as a country have the right, the people in the country have the right to access government information. And a lot of my, my, my uh, other, in my inter introducing party touched on that, how important it is to have access to, to the information that is created and collected by the government. Um, so 1813, we already talked about this very briefly, 203 years ago, 203 years, that's quite, I mean, not, long now long but that's quite a long time um started the distribution of a copy of the house and senate um, journals to select university and state libraries in 1861 155 years ago the u.s government printing office and now the u.s government publishing office was founded it Right. <laughs> and it was um, brought into, it was March 20th, um, brought into actual, like, it, we're going to start now, um, during the inauguration of Abraham Lincoln. So um, this is all very, very timely as far as being in March. Um, and then 75 years ago, again, a whole lifetime of uh, federal government documents um, at University of Mary Washington. Okay, so I talked to you about analog computers. Um, in the 1940s, um, along came digital computers. And again, we think, we think of digital information starting in the 90s, I think subconsciously, I don't know if all of us think this, but it really did start in the 1940s. Um, this is the ENIAC computer, one of the earliest computers, and I'd like to point out that some of the earliest computer programmers, most of them were women. Um, in honor of Women's History Month. <laughs> um, in fact, the, the first computers were women actually computing things. <laughs> um, and then they became, soon became the, the computer programmers. Um, and so I just want to point out, so digital meaning information is encoded in binary digits, either ones or zeros, on or off, which is what makes it a little bit different than analog computing. And then moving forward, we have hypertext. Um, and this is a picture of Vannevar Bush. In 1945, he wrote a paper called As We May Think, where he conceived of hypertext um, in a, a system that he called the Memex. And so the concept is being able to link one document by uh, a certain piece of text to another document. And as we know, hypertext is the underlying um, linking system behind the World Wide Web as we know it today. So it did take a while from the 40s until the 60s until it started being uh, conceived of and created. Um, and moving forward in this kind of broad story here, 1966 Freedom of Information Act. Even though our country was founded on the notion, not solely on the notion, but partially on the notion of access to information and access to government information, um, it was the Freedom of Information Act that really uh, kind of brought that back home to our country. And I just think this is interesting. 1988, the first CD-ROMs were distributed to federal depository libraries. Um, who, who still has a computer that can read a CD-ROM? Yeah, most of us, but not everybody, right? So this is changing. Um, and it's getting more and more difficult to access content on CD-ROMs over time, right? 
1990. So hypertext leads into the kind of birth and then subsequent growth of the World Wide Web, which is really how we are experiencing information today and how a great deal of government information is being shared, collected and shared through the World Wide Web. 1996, the Internet Archive. So 10 years or six years after um, the web started coming to life, uh, Brewster Kahle decided this is important. This information is the story of who we are today and we need to start collecting that information and saving it. Um, and so what he did is he used some, some scripts to what we call crawl the web and pull the underlying code that presents what we see as the web and save it and provide access to it. You can go to the Internet Archive or what we call the Wayback Machine and you can look at websites from way back, right? Um, I had some websites in 1997, 1998, and I can find those old websites. <laughs> and so this is actually really important in, in looking at, our, say, our government information over time, how, how the government, what, what websites the government had over time, um, and also just who we are as a people, old blogs um, that are gone and forgotten, old pictures that went online that you wish never existed. <laughs> you can find most of it on the Internet Archive. So in this same year, the Long Now Foundation, not only in the same year, in the same building, um, the Long Now Foundation um, started. Um, so I, I gave you a little bit of background of what their thinking is. Um, and I'm going to take us now out off of our path and we're going to go up into the mountain over here. Um, and one of the, the first, their first two projects, or their first big project, was to build a 10,000 year clock and library. They purchased this mountain. How many people look into I'm, I, They bought a mountain. <laughs> um, and this is actually one of the hole that they have bored into the mountain as the entrance into this space where they will be housing this magnificently beautifully beautiful and beautifully designed clock that is designed to preserve our notion of time for well 10,000 years is, is the goal but hopefully beyond that um, this mechanism here um, is probably about half the width of the screen um, that's just the chime to like when 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 it, it's chiming certain uh, times like you know we're, oh we're at 100 years and so it has a special chime for 100 years etc. Um, and so really and they're so they've started several projects to ex ex again expand our notion of what now is and this is their big founding project um, but it also comes with a library um, and so I've been working with them almost 10 years now and I keep asking him what about the library what about the library what are you going to do with the library what's that going to be they're like uh I don't know <laughs> I'm like okay so every time I see them I ask them and finally what they've come up with um, as Rosemary brought up was this manual of civilization um, and the manual of civilization is designed to collect all of the information we would need in order to start a civilization from the ground up. Um, and they haven't, so, so they started with this idea and then they asked all of their board members and their founding members, so Brian Eno, Kevin Kelly, Stuart Brand, um, those are the big names I can think of off the top of my head. And they're like, what, what books do we need um, to include in this library that will help us rebuild a civilization. Say, hypothetically, if we have to duck and cover and everything gets wiped clean, where do we start from there? Um, also, if, we, if, if the world implodes and we go off on a rocket ship and find a new planet, what do we do to start from the beginning? Um, so these guys basically just looked at their, their own libraries and, and wrote down all the titles of the books and submitted them in these really big long lists. Um, they, I think it's still open, so if you have ideas for what should be included, you can submit your ideas as well. Um, and so we've had public ideas that, that we've collected. Um, so I looked at this list 
I'm like, oh, well, there's Kevin Kelly's uh, library. <laughs> I'm like, but is this really what we need to, do we have everything that we need in order to restart a civilization based on Kevin Kelly's library? Um, I don't think so. Um, there's lots of really great science fiction books in there, <laughs> um, which could be useful in thinking ahead, um, but not necessarily like how to smelt metal right um, or how you know how to start a fire things like that so what i i am doing for them is um, and being from the library and information sciences i'm i'm into categorizing and cataloging information um, so looking at our, our different cate categoriz categorization systems so the library of congress um, and dewey decimal and thinking looking at those i'm like well this isn't really helping me but I had started playing this game called Civilization. Um, and in this game, you, are take, you're, you start with one, like two people and you grow your own civilization over time. And within this game, they have a, a really complex but very well thought out what they call technology tree. And these are the technologies that you need to acquire in order to grow your civilization. So what I did is I wrote down all of those categories and have been going through myself and my graduate assistants, I'm um, going through this list of hundreds and hundreds of books that have been recommended for the, the manual for civilization and adding them to each of the categories that I found in the civilization game. Um, and not surprisingly, we found quite a few gaps um, in the types of information that we need. Um, but we also discovered in some of the books that were um, shared, um, there were some gaps in the, the, in the, in the ca categorization system. So we're basically creating an amalgamation of both um, the books that were given to us and the civilization categorizations to create a, a documentation of what types of information we need. And from there, we can, can fill in the gaps. Um, but I'm thinking... If we have all of these books and we're going off in a spaceship somewhere, I don't really know how we're going to carry all of those books with us. <laughs> um, but really, it's, it's a concept of thinking about how to move, and move our civilization forward and continue telling the story of who we are as a people in the very long term. Okay, so we'll go back from the mountain. Whoa! Okay, so this brings us to 2016. Just last month, they produ uh, the, uh, the um, government publishing, um, publishing office produced this report. Um, very, very timely. Um, so I read through this report um, and I pulled out the vision and mission. Actually, there's a lot of really good stuff in here. So if you want to look at this later, you can let me know. Um, so the vision is, and we're t the report is on the access plan for access to US government information. And again, bringing this back to this founding idea is it's not just about collecting this stuff, but it's about providing access to it. And this is really the, the core purpose of collecting the government information is providing access to the people. Um, so the vision is to provide government information when and where it is needed. And the mission is to provide readily discoverable and free public access to federal government information now and for future generations, right? And that's dot, dot, dot. That can go on. That goes on for um, what we say in the state archives, the life of the republic and hopefully beyond the life of the republic. So the story of who we are as the, the people of the United States can move on into the future, much like the Code of Hammurabi and the writings from uh, you know, several thousand years ago or the Lascaux Caves of 15,000 years ago. So I thought that this was very timely and very important for what, what, what we're doing here with the Federal Depository and also the way Long now thinks about looking far into the future. Okay. So this is where my this is where my thinking comes in. Um, and again, you you think about this as well. And I want to see what you what you what you think. Um, so when I was doing my master's degree, I became very interested in digital preservation and thinking long term, ten thousand years. And I was thinking, well, what information? 
has survived tens of thousands of years and has produced a message that long, that far into the future. Um, and my first thought was DNA. We, what are we, if not expressions of genetic information that's encoded essentially like our computers in a binary system? So we have DNA is made up of adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, and only adenine only pairs with thymine, cytosine only pairs with guanine, and so essentially you have a binary information system. Um, and so when I did my master's paper, it was about 10 years ago now, <laughs> almost 10 years, um, there were several um, groups of scientists who were actually doing this, encoding human readable, not, not you can't read it, but hu like information that is useful or, or relevant to human beings in DNA. Um, and I won't go into the details of how they did it, um, but really, really fascinating. Um, Okay, but think about this. What are the problems with this? I mean, aside from, you know, we're messing with DNA. Um, what, what do you need to read messages encoded in DNA? I can guarantee it's not something that the average public has access to. Like, I'm gonna have a DNA reader and see what secret messages are encoded in this fruit fly. Um, so I think that kind of, that by itself could shoot down the usefulness of encoding information in DNA over the long term. There's also issues with mutability. Um, when, say, a living organism has, say, a message encoded in it, and it, we're trying to pass it on in the genes over time through mating, um, well, what happens when, we, when opposite sexes mate is the DNA changes over time. So really that message may not be quite so stable over the long term. Um, so this is what I was thinking, this is what I was exploring. I was like really trying to think, well, what is the wildest thing that we can come up with to send messages to the future, essentially? Um, so looking at problems with DNA, I was thinking, well, maybe we can make nanobots, we can design our own little tiny machines to um, encode these messages and bring them into the future. But then, you know, we, we all have watched a million movies about robots taking over. Um, think if we have billions of nanobots, what's going to happen there? Um, really, this, just, this is just brainstorming, thinking what could we possibly come up with? Um, and there have been a number of systems and promises like gold discs and things that will preserve your information forever and every single one. I was like, ah, I don't know. Well, there's this problem, there's this problem, there's this problem. But just a few weeks ago, almost a month ago now, I stumbled across this stuff. And this is the first thing that I have seen that actually seems like it might work. Um, this is um, a, was a five-dimensional um, quartz encoded information or information encoded in quartz using a very, very small laser. It's very, very hot, very, very small laser that it's able to encode human, like, like English language words into the structures of this quartz material that they've created. And this is brand new, um, but it actually seems feasible if we want to, say, write all of our government documents into one of these little disks, um, it will last essentially forever, millions of years. It is not just stone like the Code of Hammurabi was carved into, but it's this human manufactured quartz material. It's yet to be tested um, because, you know, we haven't been around for a million years to see how long it actually lasts, but I actually think it's, it's feasible. Um, I have a, some more. One of the most important things that makes this feasible to me is that it can hold 360 terabytes worth of data, right? That's huge. So we could fit, you know, I don't know how many terabytes are in the government, <laughs> government publishing office right now, um, but we can fit a really huge portion of that. So maybe five of these will, will contain the entire 
government history of the United States, right? And that's just a really rough estimation. We could take the Manual of Civilization on one of these up in space with us and start civilization. Of course, my first question then is, as with all technology, how are we going to access this stuff? Yes, we can read. This is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that's written onto this particular disk. But we can't read the rest of the stuff that's in there because it's tiny. So we do need to make sure that we have the readers that makes this information accessible over time. But if we have all of our entire government history recorded on these things, we're probably going to think it's important enough to maintain readers over time to access this stuff. And this also makes me think of the Superman, um, was it the memory crystals, right? Sort of the same concept. Um, but we're really, we're really getting into the sci-fi future here. Um, I'm very excited about this. Um, so we'll, we'll see. So, um, and the funny thing is, I, I sent a link to this to Laura Welsher at the Long Now Foundation. And two days later, she had the guy who invented this over at the Long Now. <laughs> and I was like, how did you do that? But it happened to be that they were presenting their research and looking for people to help start manufacturing this. Um, all the articles I read, you just see the disc and there's a, a little video that shows how how the laser works, but I haven't seen what the reader looks like at all. So again, this is brand new. I still have questions, but this seems really promising to me. So um, with all that considered, I'm curious to know, because I have my ideas and they can be pretty wild, I admit, um, but what, what do you think? Um, do you have thoughts or ideas about what, what, how you see our information moving into the future. And I can give you if anybody has thoughts or if you have any questions about anything that I've presented here. And I can give you the microphone. Anyone? Wow. Any, any just random questions? <laughs> How did you end up at the Long Now Foundation? <laughs> I'm curious to know how you're organizing all of this information. I mean, especially from a point of view, if you're talking about starting civilization over, um, you can't like drop some obscure law on someone who's the first thing they run across. So how are you making this accessible from that point of view? Like where to start? That's an excellent question. Um, right now, I mean, there has been no organization. In fact, the first level of organization is me coming in as a librarian going like, what are you doing? <laughs> we need some organization. But I think that's a really a good point. Um, I mean, right now, it's just a bunch of bookshelves in, in the, the long now interval um, that people can peruse and read and you know, drink some alcohol and talk about. <laughs> but that's probably not how things are going to start. Like how to how to uh, create a distillery, to <laughs> have some alcohol to talk about. No. Right. Yeah, Con and this is the cataloger in the room. <laughs> uh, con <laughs> context is deeply important. Um, and yeah, we'll thank you for bringing that up. We absolutely need to include that. Is this all English language information? This is another thing I've been thinking about. It all is in the English language. Um, and I did bring up Laura Welcher, who is the resident linguist. Um, and they also, as part of their project, created the Rosetta Disk, where they have been collecting. It's a really huge project and collecting information about all of the languages that have existed on the planet um, and basically trying to create a huge Rosetta Stone. Um, so it is and is very Eurocentric. Um, and um, and there, have been, there has been some criticism for that as well. And I think that's going to be another one of my pushes. And like, okay, it's all English language. It's all Eurocentric. But, w you know, the United States is not all of the world civilization. There's so much more that we need to you know, bring into that story. So, so to answer your question, yes. And to expand on that, I agree that we need to think beyond that. So. 
How do you decide what information is significant to include in this library and what's not? You mentioned earlier about a book about how to start a fire, but you also joked a second ago about not including something about how to start a distillery. I mean, to you that may not be important, but to other people they would, they would, uh, they might argue otherwise. Oh, we find ways. <laughs> um, and that br that brings up a really great great question. That um, so in the game civilization, it's a video game, so of course it's very um, connected to warfare. And the, most of the technologies, and in fact, you could even say this about civilization, but most of the advances in technologies that we've had are as a result of defense. Right? Um, some of the greatest science has happened through warfare. Um, and so I was talking about this with um, Alexander Rose, who's the executive director. Um, and so I'm like, oh, well, I, I notice you don't have anything about you know, how to build weapons. He's like, well, what if we didn't include anything about building weapons? Would that change the way human beings are with each other? Think about that. <laughs> Do you think, I mean, and so we talked about this at lunch for a little bit, but I, I, I kind of, I think it's a, a noble and optimistic idea. However, <laughs> I, we, we have to defend ourselves, right? If, if you have some great technology, if you've got all the good food and another group doesn't, they're gonna wanna, they're gonna wanna find a way to get that from you and you need to find a way to protect yourself. So, I mean, it is, it's difficult to make these overarching decisions about what we need, but we're, we're thinking about these questions. Should we include information? Yes, we should include information about how to distill alcohol. <laughs> um, it's the lubricant of society. It's been around forever. Um, but really looking at the basic technologies that we need in order to um, protect ourselves, to um, create homes, to um, create agriculture and food and feed ourselves. And so looking at like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I think would be a good way to start with that. Like what do we need as human beings in order to survive in the wild and then grow and expand as a culture? So, yes. So, okay. Okay. Uh, Who wouldn't? Uh, <laughs> I said, who wouldn't? <laughs> Um, the whole earth stuff or um yeah i i i wouldn't say directly but it's it's again as you're saying this this indirect influence on on these larger ideas through these you know discussions that have happened um and yeah i think that's a really astute observation of just that that presence of that idea and i also want to point again to conversations we had over lunch and what rosemary's doing with her her maker space too is this idea of returning to our ability to make things ourselves and i think that's really important um especially in in our consumer culture we can go out and buy everything we need I mean, if you're having to start civilization, you can't do that. And so learning how to make food and um, how to knit and make clothing um, 
those are very are really important kind of basic concepts and yeah getting back to the earth like the whole earth catalog so i did see did your hand where your hand was up do you This is, there's a book on this. I think it's called Deep Time. Um, or it, it talks about this idea of how do we warn people of where there's um, radi radiated materials around and how do we warn people, say, 10,000 years from now? Um, so, or even just with our, the, um, the waste from our nuclear power plants, where we're storing it. Um, interestingly, my mother worked at the WIP site in New Mexico um, when I was a kid, or she helped the engineers with that. Um, but it's a really difficult, that is probably one of the most important pieces of information we want to move in the future, at least on this planet. Um, and um, coming up with ways, and I don't, I can't remember there being a real solution to this over time, but really um, just a, a collection of uh, data symbols, right? A very simple symbol that we as a culture share, like oral histories. Like, remember, this symbol means that this is dangerous, um, a dangerous space, right? Um, and then I know you had your hand up, and then I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Well, it just struck me, I gather, that the courts thing is, is um, in, in the English language, so basically a strong magnifying glass, which as a government documents librarian, I'm also, of course, the microfilm and microfiche librarian, and I've always said that. You need just something to make it big, and you can, can read it. I guess my other question was, um, it also struck me that, you know, there are a lot of movies, like I think on The Big Bang Theory, they f were trying to figure out how to pass something off to the future, and they did it with music. I wondered if the Long Now Foundation has ever like surveyed what the what the culture has you know pop culture on that kind of thing their their ambition to pass things off to the future um, yes absolutely and i think that's why there's actually quite a few um uh, sci-fi novels in the manual of civilization so thinking about all of these different ways that um, writers and novelists have thought about um, how we're going to move information into the future um, and well, and I know Neil Stevenson also is, is one of Rosemary's favorite authors, <laughs> one of mine as well. And he's associated with the Long Now Foundation, but um, he writes about this type of thing too. Um, so that yeah, definitely, and and that that might be their favorite thing to do. <laughs> it's a it's a little more fun than you know yeah. So do you want that? <laughs> That's why I'm here. Here, here. <laughs> yep, thank you. And, and we clapping. <laughs> we support access to information. Information wants to be free, right? This is sort of one of our librarian principles. Um, and two, I like the idea of, I mean, the Long Now Foundation started as a, a think tank, and I think it still is very much this think tank. It's growing in membership. Um, 
But I, I like this vision of connecting what they're doing with these larger governmental institutions, which I think would, would strengthen and broaden these ideas moving. And I think both the long now and the government could benefit from, from at least a, a meeting of minds, right? So, so any other thoughts, burning questions, uncertainties? Um, okay, well, thank you very much for having me here. Um, it's been a pleasure.